And guess what happens next year? Two things. We have an election and we have a having. <laughs> it's going to happen. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is famous financial expert and Bloomberg market analyst, Mike McGlone, who in this video discussed Bitcoin and its liquidity problem and macro analysis of the U.S. and global economy. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. The United States government's frosty approach to cryptocurrency regulation could ultimately see the industry's center of gravity shift to Hong Kong, says Amber Subaran, the CEO of Paris-based institutional crypto market data provider Keiko. The U.S. has been at the forefront of the crypto sector for quite some time. However, with the government seemingly adopting a regulation by enforcement approach, there is a growing feeling by some that a significant amount of companies, developers and investors will soon flock elsewhere to work in friendlier environments. One million tech jobs are at risk of going overseas. As the U.S. goes down a path of regulatory uncertainty, the EU, UK, UAE, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia and Japan are all creating environments for crypto to flourish so that they can capitalize on the next wave of innovation. Well, this is the thing that's been an epiphany for me since 2018. I am in Hong Kong and I'm learning the lessons of, uh, I've always known, I've been, have luxury, I've only lived out of the country for about a year and I was in France and I learned the lesson of the old Frank from the people who lived through um, World War II back then. I, um, but it's a concept of the base in currencies. You really learn that in South Florida. But to me, this is um, what's happening globally is we're realizing that um, the dollar is more and more becoming the world's base layer and it's happening organically through crypto dollars, stable coins, and they're imperfect. But the unique thing that happened with USDC is it dropped almost the exact amount it was exposed to a bank. Yet, if not the treasuries, which is, okay, what's the problem here? US banking. So to me, this is where I want to really rope in what um, where we're going now is we had hikes two weeks ago from the uh, European uh, East European Central Bank and last week from the Fed and the Swiss National Bank and I picture I just try to if I'm lucky enough to live to be old uh, or picture in a conversation with a grandchild saying grandpa so did the Swiss National Bank really raise rates at the same week that they had a merger with one of their failed banks and only became one bank? And did the Federal Reserve really raise rates about during a severe banking crisis? Did we not learn anything, rules of the Great Depression from what's happening right now and and what's happened in, in 2023, what were they doing wrong back then that caused this great reset, which is my pick. So I look at this in real time, this is just shocking stuff that they look at 12 month measures in place. Yes, stubborn core, I get it. But if you just look at forward looking things like housing's dropping at a higher velocity than, than 2006 and seven. Now I was getting really bearish in 2007 in the stock market. I was trading actively back then. It took a while, like that movie, the-, um, the Big short. Yeah, I mean, it can relate to it because you got to get stopped out first and then the market goes away. I knew a lot of people th that did. So to me, this is the key thing I took away from our meeting this morning. Um, our chief economist filled in was Stuart Paul. He, he had two key quotes. He said, we had a dovish hike. I'm like, OK, well, that's an oxymoron. They hiked. Um, his quote pointed out deposits are leaving the banking system to money market funds. We get that at the greatest pace ever. And we're seeing a credit crunch. And the point is they still hiked. And I look at myself and think to myself, okay, well, what happens a year from now? It's not, I don't see anything good coming out and so somehow we get lucky. I think one of the classic, most classic examples we're gonna read about from the future is of human nature and markets and just poor timing. Um, and that is what you just said is first of the 2% target in, in core inflation or CPI, these you use um, core, um, is going to go negative very soon and that's, based on facts, I will show it to point out in a second. But it's also, they were way far behind in the, the inflation, which picked up, but partly because they, we created way too much liquidity. But let's remember two years ago, oh, a little bit more than that, we didn't even have vaccines. So it was a pretty good scare. And then they're way, way too far 
tightening rates. I mean, I look at it as a you know benefit of hindsight. You start should start at tightening rates at the end of 20, beginning of 21, when S&P 500 made new highs. But they waited too long. So now we're in that transitory stage where we're tightening into a severe global economic contraction, almost inevitably. I don't see what stops it. And so here's where deflation is going to pick and kick on July 13th. That's the day we're going to measure the producer price index on a year-over-year measure from June. And there is precedent for the most significant negative number ever for that came on in July of 2009. Why? Because commodities pumped and then they collapsed. That period then was uh, measured from the peak in 2009 and our measure of year-over-year -year deflation was minus 6.9%. That was the lowest ever in our database going back to, what, 1950. This July, we're going to measure from June from the high in commodities. It's going to be negative, almost guaranteed, in my view. If it's not, it's going to tip, tilt down because the, the number's so delayed. So these are just pure mathematical facts. That So here's a fact. The Bloomberg Commodity Index has dropped 30% from its peak. Now, that's the key leading indicator on the planet for deflation. It's commodities, um, crude oil, natural gas, all those things. The peak, the trial in 2008, the biggest correction we had in a long time was 50%. So we're almost there. It's just so lagging. And that's where I'm seriously concerned about this lagging nature of economists and human nature to look and not look forward to what's really happening and how bad it can get. And I don't want to be a fear monger. I just need to point out facts. So the key thing I'm watching now, the number one thing I'm watching is that stock market, S&P 500. It's hovering around 4,000. The way I look at it is it's on a cliff's edge and everything is dependent on its staying up. I look at commodities. You look what happened with gold on Friday. Gold was up above 2,000 for a while. S&P was down a percent. And as soon as the stock market recovered, gold went down. Everything is waiting on what the stock market is going to do in this situation. And I still fully expect what's around 4,000 the S&P 500 is more likely to go through to 3,000 and a normal correction in an economic correction in a bear market. The difference from this and any other one is the Fed is still tightening to fight the forward-looking indicators showing severe deflation. So to me, this is a problem right now where the Fed is. I remember being in the trading pits back in the 80s and thinking, we need someone from markets who understands markets on the Federal Reserve Board. I'll turn myself maybe someday. I don't know if I'm getting too old. Because you need to look forward to what's happening. And I just look what um, the peak in housing was, it, the velocity of its decline right now is greater than from this 2006 to 2011 housing correction. It's, it's dropping faster now on a global basis. And the, the thing I'll end with is studying booms and busts in history. Every single boom has come on the back of liquidity. We just had the biggest pump in liquidity ever. That's dumping. Now, if you heard me repeat this, but now we're seeing it real time. The dump is starting and the Fed is still, virtually most central banks are still pulling that liquidity. But the key thing I wanted to get to here is what's happening is quite unique. So Bitcoin to me and gold are enduring. Bull markets have dipped for good fundamental selling reasons. Um, you can't bring in more supply and demand and adoption increase, and most notably Bitcoin. Crude oil and most fossil fuels are enduring. Bear markets have bounced, and that bounce is creating that elasticity forces to make it go lower. But the key thing I want to tilt to on the macro, Scott, is we're heading towards a severe recession based on almost every measure of the curve, what's happening in, tight, in the Fed, and it's all coming to maybe later this year. And guess what happens next year? Two things. We have an election and we have a halving. <laughs> it's going to happen. So I think it's almost a guarantee that we'll have a severe recessionary deflationary period by the time we get a year from now and by the time we're into that election period, which means whatever incumbent is will be pushed out. Unless they get lucky, you almost always push out and you almost always go to the other party, some form of young Republican. It's just normal scales. And at the same time, we're going to severe deflation. The Bitcoin supply is going to drop. It's going to just hit hard, I think, like, wow. This is a revolutionary asset. It doesn't respond like crude oil does, like, oh, you have to bring the price up and people just create more of it and use less of it. It's just those early days of adoption. I wonder what's going to stop the bumps in the road. But to me, those are some major macro calls based on simple facts of recession kicking in. And that is we're going to flip, flip the towards a very severe re Republican leaning because of recession. You almost always do that. Right, of course. And you know, Bitcoin, might Bitcoin might have that catalyst. It's already starting now to to trade more like a risk off asset like gold and bitcoin although i still kind of worried about that when that s p 500 finally breaks and maybe it won't but so to me that's 
pretty deep macro there, but very high probability because of this the highest probability recession from the yield curve in, since the 80s that we're going to have some major shifts in politics and then it's all going to line up with the, the uh, having. Yes, short term, it's going to be a bump in the road for Bitcoin. But look at the macro. This is called credit contraction. And look what happened with 2022. What market went down the most? Cryptos. Why? Because they, they're the fastest horse in the race. What's going up the fastest this morning? But that credit contraction that we're having from this banking crisis could and should, I think, if normal human nature matters, should be just early days. Because what you said earlier, what was the main source for this issue is the most significant aggressive hiking from the Federal Reserve ever from zero. If you book it on a logarithmic scale, it's the most ever. And we go back to like 1962 on that. Um, and they're still hiking. So why, why are banks having issues? Well, because the, their reserve assets, the off balance sheet reserve assets are just collapsing because of duration, <laughs> because they're still hiking. I just find this, man, I'm going to write the textbooks and, they're, and I think people are going to look back and you know, if we get out of this without a Great Depression, that would be wonderful. But if we have the normal economic response to this, they're going to look back and say, that was really silly, stupid. Why did we do that? So I look at Bitcoin, what you're pointing I'm glad you pointed that out because I haven't really read it, but I need to dig into the weeds of that. And to me, that's part of the bump and roll. But to me, that's the macro of credit contraction showing up. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Mike McGlone. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.